this video is going to be all about stack ups and I really hope after you finish watching this video you will have better understanding why you would like to order layers in your PCB specific way. So I really hope uh, after watching this video you will completely understand why you would like to order signal and ground and power plane layers in your PCBs specific way. And I really hope also after you will watch this video you will know how you would like to maybe order layers in your own PCBs. Uh, we are going to start this video with some basic theory, nothing complicated, okay? We just would like to see uh, what is happening around the tracks and also what is happening between the layers and tracks, uh, between the power planes and ground planes in your PCB. We would like to uh, talk a little bit about this field because uh, then you will better understand why we would like to order layers specific way because of this field. But as I said, it's not going to be nothing complicated. It is just to help you to imagine better what is happening in your PCBs. Uh, then we will talk also about copper pour. Uh, when you would like to uh, pour, for example, ground or power planes on the same layer where your signals are. Uh, we are going to talk about changing reference planes. So when your, when your signal travels and you have to change reference planes, what is actually happening on your PCB and why you need to be careful. And uh, then uh, we are going to talk also about the distances between uh, between layers in your stack up, how the distance is important uh, for power planes or uh, how the distance between signal layers and ground plane or power plane is important in your stack up. And then, uh, of course, we will have a look at some examples. We will talk about four layer stack ups, six layer, eight layer, up to 34 layer, all the kind of different stack ups. We will uh, have a look uh, at some specific examples of these stack ups and we will try to understand why a specific uh, layer ordering is good or bad for these specific stack ups. This video is based on my call with Rick Hartley. I would like to thank you very much to Rick for finding time uh, for this call. And uh, I really hope you will find it uh, useful and you will find it interesting. So uh, next I'm going to play the video from my call with Rick. And uh, as I mentioned before, we are going to start with fields. So here it is. When you launch a signal into this transmission line, and keep in mind, and I know you know this as well, a transmission line doesn't consist of a trace it consists of a trace and its return path. You have to have both sides, you have to have both pieces of copper to have a transmission line. And that's very important when understanding board stacks. So when you launch energy into this transmission line, the energy starts out as a set of electric fields that travel into the dielectric space, attaching themselves to the trace and to the planes. Those electric, the energy in the electric fields causes the movement of electrons in the copper. The movement of electrons act as charge carriers to help move that energy through and also at the same time to generate a magnetic field where the rest of the energy resides. So all of the energy in this case is in the electric and magnetic fields and it moves through the dielectric and attaches itself to this copper because the copper helps create a lower impedance path. When you have an outer layer trace like this one, then the fields aren't quite as well contained as they are on an inner layer. And that's a key component, which we'll talk about in a short while relative to board stack up. But anyway, fields are better contained in this arrangement than they are in that arrangement. Here's an example of a four layer board that I see a lot. I do a lot of consulting with people 
who call me up or email me and say, Rick, I've got an EMI problem. I have a signal integrity problem. I have a this, I have a that. And the very first question I ask them is, what's your board stack up? And I'm sure you know exactly why that's the first question I ask. Because the, if they don't get the board stack up right, the rest is, uh, is moot. And when I see this board stack up, what concerns me, the reason this is a problem, if this were a digital board, for example, and with signals on one going, let's say, in the X direction, and signals on two going in the Y direction, the fact is the signals are going in opposite directions, one in the X, one in the Y. So the coupling that occurs between those lines is very small. But why is there coupling at all? Because both of these, the fields from both of these, reference the ground plane on layer three. The signals on one couple all the way to three, and the signals on two couple to three to develop their fields. Now, some of the energy from the signals on one also couples into the fields for the signals on two. And that's why people often have EMI problems with a board like this. I see this a lot in the automotive industry, the US automotive industry. I don't know about Europe, but in the US, this is a commonly used board because they're often using microcontrollers. They don't need to have a power plane. They can usually route power because micros typically have fairly slow rise times <clears throat> and power delivery is not as critical as it would be with a high-end microprocessor. So they will usually route power, route signals, and they'll have one ground plane and three layers of routing. And the reason this creates a problem is the amount of energy that's coupled between layer one and layer two is very small. It's not enough to cause signal integrity problems in a digital board, but it's more than enough to set up enough common mode current to create an EMI problem. And therein lies the rub. It might take tens of milliamps or even hundreds of milliamps of common coupling to cause a signal integrity problem because, of our, because we have noise margins. ICs have noise margin. But EMI can be generated through a few microamps of common mode energy. And it takes almost nothing to generate that low level of, of common mode current. So does so it this mean- This is one way, go ahead, sorry. Sorry for interrupting you, but uh, That's right. uh, I would like to just, so does it mean that even if you have like more layers stack up, then it is still better to have like ground plane, signal layer and ground plane comparing to ground play plane then uh, signals routed in x direction signals routed in y direction and ground plane this would be still bad if the signals are going out of the board not necessarily the fact that you have two ground planes with two signals in between them that's where dielectric thickness comes into play uh -huh. Okay, because so this is especially both, important for if it's routed on top layer, then? That's, that, it's really a problem when it's the outer two layers. Okay. That's where this becomes a really serious problem. Now, what I generally tell people who contact me to do with this is to treat the top layer, layer one, as its own circuit board. Now, keep in mind, layer two and layer three are both, both directly referencing, I'm sorry, layer two and four are directly referencing the ground plane on three, right? So they're in pretty good shape. What you need to do is to keep the fields from layer one out of that dielectric space between two and three. And how can we do that? By routing ground with the signals. There are a lot of people who will tell you that pouring copper on signal layers or routing ground on signal layers is not a good idea. And sometimes it isn't a good idea. There are times when it doesn't help. But if you have a board like this, you have to do something with layer one. And the only way you're going to control that energy is to have a coplanar return path. Now, this is a board that was designed it was redesigned by my friend Dan Beaker. He's an app engineer for NXP Semiconductor. He works in the automotive industry. One of his customers contacted him with this problem, and he had them reroute the board and route the grounds between the signals. And it got rid of the problem. In truth, 
as Eric Bogatin pointed out with his Altium presentation last year, his Altium Live presentation, connecting these ground traces only at both ends is probably not good enough. Now it worked in Dan's case, but in truth, these ground traces should be, should be grounded every 10th wavelength of the maximum harmonic frequency in the signal. That's how often they should be grounded. Because uh, if you don't, then you won't stop the resonance that will develop in that dielectric space. Okay, so I have two questions. Yes. First, first one, uh, the white lines, they are like only hypothetical line, lines. Yeah, these are basically the, or uh, not hypothetical, but in the, I mean, in the polygon on the left, it's kind of hypothetical. Hypothetical because yes, yes, line. yes. In the polygon but, on the left. Yeah, but between the tracks, they are real ground tracks. And uh, even in the polygon on the left, you still should place the vias uh, close to the other vias where the track has the vias, correct? That's correct. That's exactly right. So you all the vias a... should be there as they are marked in the picture. Yeah, more or less like this. You you still want as a reasonable number of ground vias underneath that IC attaching that ground pour on the top of the board. You know why that ground pour is on that layer? Because this IC had a tendency to give off its fields very badly. Mm -hmm. It was not, the IC was not well designed, okay? And because of that, Dan wanted to help, con help contain the fields from the IC. So he put that ground pour on layer one right under the IC to help draw the fields from the IC down toward the surface of the board so they wouldn't couple off of the IC into other things. Okay. And, and, this, and these, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, and basically now when the tracks are routed on the top layer, it means the fields are not going to down to layer three because that's much further then the polygon or the traces which are routed close to these tracks. So the field or most of the field will be uh, between these tracks and polygon or between these tracks and ground tracks, correct? That is correct. That's exactly okay. correct. Okay, and now when you say about these uh, resonances, that's my second question. I, I still don't kind of, I, I don't know how to imagine these resonances. What, where these resonances would be and why they would be problems. So they would be between this uh, ground uh, track and the other track? Well, in this particular case, the, the, what really, you don't actually get a resonance in, in this particular case. What you end up with, in this case, we're stopping the development of common mode currents by keeping the fields coupled close to the line. We're keeping them from coupling all the way to layer three. And again, this is not perfect. This is not an ideal layout, but it was good enough that it solved that, that company's problem. Uh, when, I'm when I was talking about resonant, resonance, I was talking about if you have a cable that comes off of a circuit board, and let's say it's, um, let's say it's six inches long, mm -hmm. uh, and if you have harmonic energy, that can couple into that cable at one gigahertz, that happens, six inches happens to be a half wavelength. Six inches, 150 millimeters is a half wavelength of a gigahertz. You're probably gonna get balance in that cable. You'll get a standing wave, mm -hmm. which causes the cable to resonate and radiate at one gigahertz. Okay. And that's the point we're trying to make, is you wanna prevent the common mode energy from coupling to places where it can couple into things that are capable of radiating. And, and usually they why... need to be the correct length. And then if you match the frequency and the length, then it becomes antenna. That's correct. It becomes an antenna. So this board stack is a problem because the layer one and layer two signals will couple lots of common mode energy into each other. And if any of them go to a cable or to something at the edge of the board that can, that can support resonance, you, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Anything that's capable of radiating like an antenna, if you couple this energy into it, you've got a big, big problem. 
So basically, for example, the signals on layer two can pick up this one gigahertz signal and then this one gigahertz signal would go out through this track and start resonate in the short. Right, and a lot of people okay. say, a lot of people say to me, Rick, we don't have one gigahertz energy in our board. And that's, and you know where I'm going with this. That's when I ask the question, what's your rise time? And they say, well, I don't know. Well, what, what's, what ICs are you using? And then I look up the IBIS models or the SPICE models for the IC, and I look up rise time in the model, and I find out they've got a 500 picosecond rising edge, a half nanosecond rising and falling signal, and that happens to equate to one gigahertz. So even if they're only clocking at 10 megahertz, they still have harmonic energy at a gigahertz in every signal on the board. And that's what people fail to understand. Another thing that's important to understand that generates common mode energy is changing layers improperly. This is a correct layer change. Think about that four layer board we just talked about. Layer three is the ground plane, layer two is a signal, layer four is a signal. If I change layers from layer two to layer four, the fields are in the dielectric space between two and three. And as, as I go through the plane with a via, I have an opening in the plane and the fields follow the energy down through that hole and go to the dielectric space between three and four. And there's no field spread when you do this. All the energy stays tightly compact in a nice tight dielectric space and there are no problems at all. Thinking back to that circuit board where layer one and layer two were signals, if you had to move a signal from layer one to either layer three or layer, I'm sorry, layer two or layer four, you'd have to have a ground via next to the signal via to carry, to keep the fields tightly coupled between the two vias. Because if you don't put a ground via next to the signal via going from one to two or one to four, the fields are gonna spread through the dielectric. And we'll talk about why with this next slide or this next picture. If I'm changing from say, let's say I have a board with two ground planes. This could be a 10 layer board. It doesn't matter what it is. High layer count board. Ground on two and ground on the layer next to the bottom. If I route a signal from the top to the bottom, the only way I'm going to avoid spreading fields in that dielectric space is if I put a ground via next to the signal via. Now, I'm a realist. Robert. I designed real circuit boards for 44 years of my career. I've been in electronics for 55 years, and I've been designing circuit boards for about 44 or 45 years of that time. I know that you can't always put a ground via next to every signal via. People who do research for a living will tell you, oh yeah, you just put in a ground via. Yeah, well, that's easier said than done. And you and I both know. That. I know exactly. What you you can't just about. put a ground. So what I will do when I have a tight area with a lot of signal vias, I'll try to put a ground via near the middle of them and a couple ground vias around the perimeter. Because one way or another, you have to contain the fields. If you don't contain the fields, the fields will couple together and you will get common mode energy coupled into transmission lines. And this is how you do it. So at this top example, you don't need a ground via. If you're going from one side of a plane to the other. With the bottom example, you do. People, and this, this is a picture from Dr. Howard Johnson that just shows where the current itself is established by the fields. And here's an interesting thing, and you may have heard me say this before. Because the current runs up the outside of the vias, the fields are between those two vias. And all of the current, especially at higher frequencies, is established on the outside of the via barrels. There is no energy moving through the insides of these vias. People worry about filling vias with things and saying, oh gosh, is that going to disrupt the energy movement through the via? The answer is no. You can fill that via with peanut butter. And it won't matter because the energy is not moving Inside the V, it's moving outside. Anyway, when you change layers from power to ground, decoupling capacitors help, help move that energy.
But as you know, decoupling caps only work up to two, maybe 300 megahertz. That's what if I, you have fast well, rising yeah. edges, <laughs> you know where this is going. If you have fast rising edges, the decoupling cap isn't going to get the job done. It's inductor. What? What's that? The coupling cap will become inductor for. That's exactly right. It becomes an inductor, and it and it's and it makes the problem worse, not better. So the way you can can do this, if you have to go from power to ground, is to keep power and ground close together. <coughs> if power and ground is no more than about 0.2 to 0.25 millimeters between power and ground, eight to ten mils max then the planes look like a capacitor, a good high frequency capacitor, and the energy that doesn't move through the capacitor will move between the planes. So in this case, it will transfer the signal, will transfer perfectly fine, even if, the, if you are changing basically reference plane. That's correct, that's correct. Now, ideally, if you're gonna reference a power plane, it should be the same plane that generated the, volt, the signal. So a 3.3 volt signal should not reference a five volt plane, for example, because when the energy gets to the receiver or as it leaves the driver, if you don't have a physical attachment from the IC to that power plane, how does the energy get in that dielectric space? It has no path. So the energy has to spread out to find a path through the other planes to get to that power plane. This, this was actually, this was one of my, my very important questions because many people ask this, like what can be, what power plane can be a good reference plane? I know and, that uh, was one of your questions. And yeah. the answer is the power plane that developed the signal. A three volt signal, a three volt plane, a five volt signal, a five volt plane, and so on. Now you can, you can reference other voltage planes. And again, you probably won't create signal integrity problems, except maybe at high gigabit frequencies. But it likely will generate EMI issues. Mm -hmm. Again, it doesn't take much field spread coupling into other things to cause EMI problems. Very okay. small amounts of energy spread can cause EMI problems. And in some, uh, some uh, or on, in many layouts, you are able to create, I don't know, one solid ground plane, but on the other side, you may have like islands of different voltages. Can Correct. you consider this as a good reference plane? The islands are a good reference plane if you, if, if, well, as a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, I have a slide that talks about that. Let me find it. Where the heck did I put it? Here it is. If, let's say you have two 3.3 ah. volt sections that are copper pores, you can route a signal across those two and as long as power and ground are close together, you will get the fields coupled down through that space to the ground plane and then back up to the power plane without generating a signal integrity or EMI problem. And if one of the these plane, is five volts, is it still going to be okay? Now, if there are different voltages, that's a problem. Then you shouldn't route it this way. And then uh, basically, when you calculate your impedance and, uh, and uh, during calculation, you are telling like, uh, what are the reference planes for this specific signal? Right. So in this calculation, can you use this kind of power plane? Yes, absolutely. I, in fact, I've done this. The key is if, let's say they're both 3.3 .3 volt planes, how big is that space between the two planes? 20 mils, maybe a half millimeter, right? Probably. How big, yeah. how big of a space do you put between power pores? Uh, minimum 0 0.2, but better is a little bit bigger because then it's easier to manufacture. Maybe a but, half millimeter. Yeah it, yeah, it depends how big is the PCB, how much space. If you route a signal across the half millimeter split, do you think it's going to create a signal integrity problem? It's an impedance change, but it's a very short impedance change. It's kind of like the 90 degree corner problem. P 
people think, oh, 90 degree corners are a problem because it's a change in the impedance, and that is true. But it's such a small change over such a short distance that it's basically invisible. This is the same way. And if Unless one of these your circuit is operating beyond five or six gigabits, there's no problem with doing this at all. And if one of these planes is five volt and the other one is 3.3, can you still? That's a problem. So because in this case, you cannot calculate impedance well, based you can on two reference planes? Because keep in mind, all impedance is, is the size of the magnetic field to the size of the electric field. And even if this plane on the right was a five volt plane, that signal still the same distance from that five volt plane. So its impedance is still going to be consistent. What's not going to be consistent is the return path. Because if that's a three volt signal and you're referencing a five volt plane, when it gets to the receiver, if the receiver isn't attached to five volts, how's the energy get into the IC? It doesn't have a path. See the problem? If you have a microprocessor or an FPGA that has a lot of built-in capacitance, interplane, or not interplane, but uh, on-die and on-package capacitance for power delivery, you can get away with a board stack like this with the planes far apart. But if you have a, an IC that doesn't have a lot of on-die and on-package capacitance, these planes need to be close together so that you have a low enough inductance between the power planes, power and ground planes, to get a low impedance at high frequencies. If you have a lot of capacitance on package and on die, then the power delivery comes from the IC package itself, not from the circuit board. I should say the high frequency power delivery comes from the IC package, not from the circuit board. So game machines, four layer motherboards, any of those things, use very carefully designed ICs where all the power delivery comes from inside the IC package, the high frequency power delivery, and none of the signals change layers. And that's how they get away with this. Because you change layers with this, you can imagine how far out the fields are gonna spread. You can't put a return via there because you don't have two ground planes. You have a power plane and a ground plane the decoupling cap is only going to be good up to two or 300 megahertz. And as you said yourself, it then becomes an inductor. So how do you get energy from layer one to layer four? You can't. That's the problem. They're in line. If, if they are closer, then you can, correct? Yes, if they're very close, less than 10 mils, less than 0.25 millimeters, yes, then you can do it. Yes. Closely spaced planes, 0.2 millimeters or less is, is my ideal number. Whenever I've got a board stack that has closely spaced planes, then I don't have any qualms at all about changing layers between power and ground. But when they're farther apart than say 0.25 millimeters, then I just come up with a, another way to do it. I don't change layers. And I would only use a board stack like this if I could design it without having to change layers. So basically everything what we uh, were talking about is important to understand how to order layers in your spec up. All of that leads to how to order layers. That's correct. Here is, I, I, I won't even get into this. This is a six layer board that we had an EMI problem with when I was at Goodrich Aerospace in the early 90s. And I don't need to tell you, you can look at it and tell, tell me why we had an EMI problem. We just talked about it. Signals on one, signals on two, referencing the same plane. We generated common mode energy. When we went to fix this problem, let me show you what we did. You're going to find this funny as could be. When we went to fix this problem, we decided that we needed to make a six layer or an eight layer board out of it. So we moved these six layers to layers two through seven of the board. <clears throat> we believed, we believed at the time and later found out we were wrong. We believed that layers one, layer, now layer two and seven, which were layer one and six, we believed they were radiating their energy out into free space. And that's what was causing the EMI problem. So we said we need to shield those. So we put a plane above and below in layers one and eight. <clears throat> and because we wanted a shield, we made them chassis ground. And believe it or not, our EMI problem got worse. 
because our ground plane on the board did not connect to the chassis anywhere. Now we have the signals that we're now on layer two, we're mainly referencing the chassis plane on layer one, but that chassis plane didn't connect to any of the ICs anywhere, which meant when the energy got back to the IC, it went, hey, where am I supposed to travel now? I don't know where to go. And it spread out and caused field spread that actually made the EMI problem worse. But I guess the chassis ground was somewhere connected to normal ground somehow, but... No, it wasn't attached to ground no? at all. <laughs> oh, in, okay. the avi- in the avionics world, we learned a long time ago that when we have to pass high levels of lightning testing, we can't attach the ground plane to the chassis anywhere. Okay. Because if we do, we're going to fail lightning testing. So the ground didn't attach to chassis anywhere, which is why it was a problem. We didn't understand at the time why we had a problem. We were purely guessing. We changed the chassis planes to ground planes and the problem went away. And we had no idea why back then. It wasn't until probably 2002 or 2003 that I looked back at this and realized, oh, now I know why we had a problem. And now I know why the ground planes fixed it. Funny, isn't it? So basically now signals on layer two were kind of strongly referencing to layer one. Yep. Layer three signals to layer four, layer six right. to layer five, and layer seven to layer eight. So they yes, were not correct. mixed and there was no this common noise uh, generated. That's right. Energy couples by the square of the distance. So the signals, the signals on layer three are, are more than twice as far from the ground on one as the signals on two. And because energy couples by the square of the distance, 80% of the energy from the signals on three is going to couple to the power plane. So you're still going to have a little coupling to layer one, but it's such a small amount that it eliminated the problem. Yeah. We the layer one has basically much lower influence to the signals on layer three than layer four. Correct. Yep. Same. Exactly. The layer, the, what was layer one and two aren't influencing each other as much as they had been. We took almost all their influence away. So this answers the question you were asking. Can you put a pair of signals between planes? And the answer is yes. Now, if this were a gigabit system, I probably wouldn't do that. If this were operating at six, eight, 10 gigabits or higher, I don't think I'd use this board stack up because it's too risky. But it worked fine with 100 megahertz clock and rise times of, you know, up to four, five, 600 megahertz. Um, let's talk a little bit about just a couple other rules, then we'll, then we'll show you some board stack. If we allow fields from one activity to cross couple with fields from another, we can end up with interference. We've been talking about that from the beginning. This is a good example of something that will cause cross coupling. If I put a signal layer between a power and ground plane, the signals, this signal layer will couple to the ground plane and to the power plane. So there are fields from the signal to power and the signal to ground. There are also power fields between the power plane and the ground plane. So all of those fields are cross coupling and this can very often and will very often lead to an EMI problem. Simply adding another ground plane really close to the power plane will completely eliminate the problem. And now when you do that, it becomes acceptable to put the signal line between the power plane and the ground plane. So this condition, it's not acceptable. This condition, it is. And, but still, we are saying that the power plane is one solid power, and ideally, it would be the power of the signal. It has to be the power of the signal. Now, it doesn't have to be a solid power plane. It could be a split power ah, plane. Okay, but it has to be... Okay, I understand. Right, it has to be the same, same power as the signal. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, it doesn't have to be. But if you don't want to generate the possibility of common mode energy, it should be. That's the right way to say it. So even Sometimes, better way is to swap now power plane with ground plane, and it would be even better. 
That would be even better. That's correct. Because if you swap this bottom power and ground plane, the signal's referencing nothing but ground, and power comes from the dielectric on the bottom, and life is good. And you can have any power planes that you like. Yep, because the signal's referencing only ground. Yes. <clears throat> this, this picture comes from Lee's second volume. He had a customer contact him once with an EMI problem. They had signals on layer one. This is a common six layer stack up, as you know. They had signals on one, they had voltage on two, VCC. They had signals on three, they had signals on four, they had a ground plane on layer five, and they had signals on six, and they had an EMI problem. <clears throat> Lee talked to them about increasing the layer count. They said, nope, not a chance. You know, if we even suggest that management will fire all of us. So, okay, fine. What can we do? So he went back to them and he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pour copper on all over layer one where there are no components or signals. And I want you to do the same thing on layer three. And I want you to attach all of that copper pour to the ground plane on layer five with lots of vias. As we just talked about, via every 10th wavelength of the maximum frequency, right? Then he said, I want you to pour copper on four and six and attach it with lots of vias to the, to the power plane on layer two. What did he do to this board stack when he added that copper pour? Well, we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. He increased the inner plane capacitance because now, instead of having power and ground just on layers two and five, he had ground on one, power on two, ground on three, power on four, ground on five, and power on six. So he had a bunch of small islands of power and ground very close together in the board stack, which increased the capacitance, the interplane capacitance of the board by eight times, it went from a small number up to an, a number eight times higher. And the, I'm sorry, yes, it went from <clears throat> 500 picofarads total interplane capacitance to 4,100 picofarads of measured capacitance. But the really important issue, it lowered the inductance by 10 times. And that improved power delivery and got rid of the cross coupling of fields between layers enough to improve the EMI signature from what you see in green to what you see in blue. Mm -hmm. There are places here where that's an eight to 10 dB improvement in the EMI signature. <clears throat> that's a huge improvement just by pouring alternating layers of power ground, power ground. Now notice Lee did not pour ground on all the layers. He alternated power ground, power ground, power ground. This is the original board stack up. What do you see that's wrong with that board stack up? Well, two things. Power is coming from that wide dielectric space between two and five, right? All the power delivery to the ICs comes from that wide dielectric space, which means the impedance is very high. The inductance in particular of the power delivery network is very high. The planes have a very high impedance. Worse than that, there are two signal layers sandwiched between power and ground. So the fields from the signal layers going from three to two, all of those fields couple into the power fields. And all of the fields from the signals from four to five also couple into the power fields. And a big part of the EMI problem they had was caused partly by poor power delivery and partly by the cross coupling of fields leading to common mode energy, which led to that EMI signature that you see in green. And simply doing this, the stack up on the right got rid of it. Notice where power comes from in this new six layer board. It doesn't come from the dielectric between two and five. It comes from a little bit of it comes from the dielectric between one and two. A little bit of it comes from the dielectric between two and three, a little bit between three and four, four and five, and five and six. So instead of having one widely spaced power delivery structure, 
we have five very closely spaced. They're smaller in area, but there are five closely spaced power delivery structures. And that's why the inductance of the power planes went down by a factor of 10, by an order of magnitude, because of the copper pour on the signal layers with lots of vias attaching the top and layer three to ground, layer four and six to power. And it created a power bus impedance that went from the gray line to the red line. That's a heck of an improvement. That's a major improvement. That'll make power delivery from the decoupling caps to the ICs much smoother. Much smoother. And it'll make the whole board just simply function better. So this is the improvement in the power ground planes by doing that. Let me just bring all this up. I, I got a call one day from a guy from Montreal. He said, we have a four layer board, power and ground in the middle, EMI problem. I, he said, management's willing to go to six layers. What would you do? And I said, I would do this in six layers. Still have two signal layers and it would completely got rid of their EMI problem because the power was now delivered through five different dielectrics instead of you know one uh, dielectric the signals all had a reference to ground and so on and so on. This is not a cost-effective design because there's only two signal layers. This is just not a great idea. If you, if you need to save money, this ain't gonna be a good plan. This is a six layer board that I absolutely love. I mentioned the people with the analog circuit that had the accelerometer problem where the, where the amplifier was, was being interfered with. This is the six layer board they went to to solve it. They only needed three signal layers and they went to this to solve it. Now, the first time I did this, I was concerned about the imbalanced construction. You know, Robert, that the fabricator needs balance in their construction to build the board. And when I first did this, I was concerned about it. That's why I poured the power on layer one, layer three, and layer five to even out the copper on all the layers. And I sent the Gerbers to them and I said, before you even build this, tell me, is this gonna be hard to build? And they said, no, not at all. Because every layer looks like a plane mm -hmm. because of all the copper you have. Mm -hmm. And it worked wonderfully. The beauty of this, all the power pores are referencing ground. All the signals are referencing ground. If you have to change layers from layer one to three, you don't need a ground via. If you change from three to five, you don't need a ground via. But if you go from one to five, you do. That's the only time you'd need a drop in a ground via. So if you're changing layers from layer one to layer five. And what about bottom layer components? We just pour ground around them. Okay. I, I've done this a lot. Now, people say to me, this can't be easy to design. And the answer is, oh, heck no. Hey, it's you've, got sig you've got signals referencing a ground pour on the bottom of the board, and you have to route the signals above the ground pour. You can't route those signals be just above the pins of the, of the components. It's really, you have to really be careful where you route stuff. Otherwise, you're going to develop a problem. So I'm not going to tell you for a second, this is an easy board to design. But people who want low layer count boards, this is how to get a low layer count board that is magnificent in its behavior. This is a four layer board, typical four layer board. In 1995, I was still in the aerospace industry as before I went to the telecom world. <clears throat> and we had an EMI problem with a board just like this. Um, it was in a product that was really inexpensive. It had to be a low layer count board and it, and it was the only circuit board in the product. So when we had an EMI problem, we pretty well knew what was causing it. It was this circuit board. <clears throat> we talked about how to solve the problem and we weren't sure what to do. We believed at the time that part of the problem was that all of our signals were routed on outer layers and we were having fields escaping from those layers because they were outer layer routing. We later realized we were wrong, but that's what we believed. So 
we decided we needed to route the signals on inner layers. So we unrouted, all I did was disconnect the signals from all of the components. I left them routed and I simply moved them to layers two and three of the board. We then said, okay, well, we've got signals on two and three now, how are we gonna do this? The beauty, they were already routed around the components because they had been routed on layers one and four mm -hmm. and they had to be routed around the components. So none of these signal lines routed under a component. So we poured ground on the top and bottom of the board and of course it poured around the components. So now all of the signals were referencing ground. Unfortunately, we still had not distributed power. And we started talking about how are we gonna do this? We have no place to put a power plane. And I started playing with it and realized that if we could pour power on the signal layers, and if we could make those power pours overlap each other, between layers two and three, so we could put vias between the points where they overlapped, that if we could get enough power pour, we could make all of the power connections that needed to be made, and they would all have a low impedance reference to the grounds on one and four. We completed the design, and it really wasn't that hard to do. Yes, it was harder than the design on the left. Let's be honest. It isn't our job to make things easy. It's our job to make them work, right? We had to have a four-layer board, and this is the one we ended up using. We got a 15 dB improvement in our EMI signature. We lowered the EMI signature by 15 dB microvolt per meter. So this may, this may be the reason why when you have a on some PCBs, they have ground on top and also on the bottom because yes. they, for example, would like to use less layers in this stack up and then they have to do it. And sandwich stuff between those grounds. And that's what makes people believe that just pouring ground on top and bottom lowers EMI. Well, because they doesn't. think that it shields. The... Yes, they think of it as a shield. It's not a shield. Mm -hmm. It's a reference for signals and power. Mm -hmm. and, and in this case, ground on top and bottom was the right thing to do. In the case of Lee's board, he, oh, come on. Here, in the case of Lee's board, ground on top and power on the bottom was the right thing to do because it generated power ground, power ground, power ground. In the case of this four-layer board, we were able to solve the problem with ground on top and bottom because power was on two and three with the signals. In that case, ground on top and bottom was the right thing to do. Um, these are other four layer stack ups that work well. This only works well if you have low component density. Obviously you can't put components and signals and power on the outside of a dense board. This just can't be done. Here's another one that's basically the same, a little bit higher density. The advantage of this, it allows the signals on layer three to be strip lined. So if you have really sensitive signals you wanna bury in the board, you can route them on layer three and this will help a lot. So, you know, both of these, there is no four layer stack up that's wonderful. As you well know, there is no, gosh, isn't that great? Four layer stack up. They just don't exist. It's four layers, you know? You can only do so much with it. Um, this for just one second, you ask about two layer boards. Yes, it was one of my- If you put signals on layer one of a board and have a 1.6 millimeter thick, 1.52 millimeter core in the board, a 62 mil thick board with ground on the bottom, the impedance of those signal lines is gonna be anywhere from 70 ohms to 140 ohms. And they're gonna change because as the signals go high and low, the fields from them are gonna impact each other. So if two signals next to each other go high at the same time, the fields are repelled and that raises the impedance of both lines. If one of them goes high while the other stays low, the fields are attracted and that lowers the impedance. So you have very poor impedance control on a two layer board with a ground plane on layer two. Very, very poor, unless you put grounds between the signals. And again, attach those grounds with lots of vias. 
Now you've got impedances with a solder mask that are anywhere from 60 to 80 ohms. You still get some, you still get some effect of things changing because of cross-coupled fields, but the effect is much, much, much smaller. Anyway, here's a better two-layer board because it's got a thinner dielectric. Yeah. This will be a 31 mil thick dielectric with a, uh, a 31 mil board with a 29 mil, which is a 0.75 millimeter FR4 core. And this is a common dielect, this is a common core. Any fabricator can get this core from their supplier at no extra cost. So if you use flex PCB, is it going to be better? Because flex PCBs are usually very- Are very thin, thin yes. Flex PCB will be much better. If you have a two layer, if this was a flex board, you probably wouldn't even need the coplanar ground on layer one. I've designed a lot of flex boards that were two and three. And now that's another thing. Flex boards can be odd layer counts, as you know. FR4 boards, rigid boards can't have odd layer counts. They have to be even layer counts. Because if you make a three layer board, the fabricator is going to charge you for four layers. If you make a six or seven layer board, they're going to charge you for eight. That's the way it works. Because they have to start with eight layers and completely remove one of the layers of copper. There is no such thing as an odd layer count board in the rigid world. Flex world's different because they stack the materials together when they make the board. So they can make a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, anything you want. And yes, in the flex world, we did a lot of in the avionics designs that we had. We had a lot of controlled impedance flex boards that were two and three layers. And they worked magnificently well. <clears throat> we put an amplifier, we <laughs> We had an accelerometer in the aircraft that sensed pitch, roll, and yaw. It was a three-axis accelerometer, and it had three outputs, one for X, one for Y, and one for pitch and roll. And it sensed all three movements, and we fed that into an amplifier circuit, amplified the signals, fed that to an A to D, and then into the digital circuitry those signals sometimes got down into the microvolt region. And we were able to put them on a three layer flex board that was ground on the top, ground on the bottom and signals in the middle. And that thing worked perfectly with a 24 bit A to D converter with no noise problems. Think about that. I think flex can be even like thinner than like normal oh, yeah. PCBs. Oh, it, it, you can have it a mil thick. When we talk about these flex, when you do these planes, I think in flex you need to use net. Or you, you can you can have cross hatch planes. Uh, that's what I you, mean. Yeah. Or you can have a solid plane. Oh, okay. It depends. See, it depends. <laughs> it depends on if the board's going to be constantly flexed. You need to use a cross hatch plane. Otherwise, you'll fatigue the copper and it'll it'll crack. If it's a board that's going to be flexed once and then stay like that, you can use a solid plane. Okay. And that's what we used to do in our avionics product. We would use cross-hatch planes. So people then say, well, you can't control the impedance of a cross-hatch plane board. We say, yes, you can. The impedance will be a little higher for a given dielectric and trace width, but you can certainly control it. You might have to make the traces a mill or two wider, you know, a, a a mil, what's a mil in millimeters? It's 25 microns. You might have to make the trace 25 or 50 microns wider, but you know, so what? Oh, here's a board, and I'm not gonna say who the company was, <clears throat> but there's an extremely well-known IC company that said in their application note, this was for a microprocessor that had 1300 pins. It was a 1300 pin BGA. And in their app note, they said, we understand that some people for cost reasons need to have a low layer count. They said the lowest layer count we could route this processor on and get everything routed out of the processor was an eight layer board with four, four signal layers. And here's the eight layer board we used. 
And I can believe, I can truly believe that the, I know the processor had a lot of on package and on die capacitance. So I can believe power delivery worked okay with this board because of that. And I can believe that signal integrity was okay. But I can tell you with clarity, they did no EMI testing. This board could not, would not pass EMI testing. Why? Because the power layers in the middle reference each other. And the power fields from 3.3 volts and 2.5 volts or 1.8 volts and 3 volts, they're going to be constantly coupling into each other. And you're going to generate high frequency cross coupling of power fields. And not only that, you've got signal layers on layer three and on layer six that are sandwiched between power and ground. So this why, a, this, let's say, why, why is it so bad to have power planes on neighbor layers? Because they will couple into each other. Most of the, remember, energy will take the path of lowest impedance. The lowest impedance path for power plane one is power plane two, not the ground plane. Yes, there will be some fields from power plane one coupled to the ground on layer two, but most of the fields will couple to power plane two. So you're going to get cross coupling between the power fields and that's going to lead to common mode energy that'll lead to EMI. Not only that, the fields that do couple from power plane one to the ground on two, will also couple into the signal fields between two and three, also causing common mode coupling. The first okay. time I did this, I was in Denmark and I presented this slide and a guy from a, a, a Danish company <clears throat> said to me, Rick, this is a, an eight layer board. There's a core in the center. You could make that center core very thick and you would get rid of the cross coupling between power one and two. And he's right, you would. But you would increase the coupling from power one into the signal layer on layer three, because now power one's gonna couple all of its energy to ground on two, and it's gonna couple all of its fields into the signal field. <clears throat> There's no way to get rid of this problem. This is a very bad board stack. So do you have like example of eight layers stack up if someone- That work? To... Yeah, right ah, there. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. These are eight layer stack ups that work. Okay. Very well. All of them. I really like the one on the right. The only microstrip traces are the ones on the top. Everything else is strip line, <clears throat> which means it's easy to control its impedance and it's easy to contain fields. Yeah. So all the critical signals can go inside the board. Power it's, is poured, sorry, go ahead. But you know, but this may not be like the best if you have like high density board and too many signals, there may not be space for proper there may power not be. planes. Then you might make it 10 layers. Yeah. And do the same thing in 10 layers. Okay. Or you can do this same thing in 12 layers. Just oh, in 12 adding. layers I do it a little bit differently because then you have more space for solid ground planes and high power planes and... That's true, that's true. You may not want to stack it this way. This is just a possibility. Okay, so let's move to 10 layer or what do we have next one on? I don't have a 10 layer stack up because okay. I don't know any I like. Okay, why you don't like 10 layer stack up? Because typically, let's go back to this eight layer stack up here. Typically what people will do, oh, let's take the one on the left. People will typically um, with a 10 layer board put signal on top, a ground plane on two, and then two signals on layers three and four and a ground plane on five, power below five on six, and then two signals and a ground on nine and signals on 10. Is that the 10 layer you typically use? No. <clears throat> usually oh, I use I usually I use signal, ground, signal, ground, power, power, ground, signal, ground, signal. Okay, as long as you can separate those powers yeah. far enough apart yeah. in the middle, then you're fine. That's a good idea. That's a good stack up. 
And I would recommend to the people listening to this to think about that. That would be a good choice. Yes. But you're you are limited on number of powers. It's, it's, there are still two layers of power, which can be usually fine. But if you have like processor with many power pins, it's, it's still may not be enough. Do. I know, I know. It becomes much harder to do. Yeah. Um, 12 layer stack up that I like a lot. Let me get to it. Oh, <laughs> I just got to say real briefly about this stack up. This is a 10 layer stack up that was nothing short of a nightmare. Notice the people who designed this, half of the middle two layers were power. So they had power, they had power on four, power on five, power on six, and power on seven. And the only ground planes were on two and nine. Can you imagine how poorly this thing performed? This thing had horrendous EMI problems. We were able to reduce this to an eight layer board and we used one of the eight layer stack I've shown earlier. And we were able to put all the power on two layers. Didn't need four layers of power. We had two layers of power, um, two sets of gr two grounds, and the rest were signal layers and it worked magnificently well. Got rid of all their EMI problems and all their signals. This is a horrendous board stack up. And look how badly they calculated impedance. Every layer was supposed to be 50 ohms. Mm -hmm. What they really were, were 45, 38, the two middle ones were 50, and then 38 and 45 again. Really bad design. Anyway, this is a 12 layer board that I like a lot um, because we would typically use higher layer count boards with really fast microprocessors or really fast FPGAs because we wanted power delivery to be near the surface where the ICs were. So we could have very short vias with very low inductance. To get that power from those planes, up into the IC through a low inductance path. Mm -hmm. So we had power and ground near the bottom mm -hmm. and power and ground near the top. And we would put ICs on both sides of the board near the power that was driving them. Secondary powers went in the middle of the board. The powers that didn't have a lot of energy pulled from them were in the center between ground. And they were usually poured on signal layers so that we had everything referencing ground as much as possible. This what is about, layer... what about like super high speed signals? Is this like, where would you route them on what of which of these layers? High speed as in eight, 10 gigabits. I wouldn't use this board stack up. Okay. I would probably only use this board stack up up to maybe four to six gigabits. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't use FR4 beyond four to six, eight gigabit stops because the losses in the material beyond six, four to six gigabits are gonna be so high that you're going to have a severe impact on signal integrity. Now, that said, if the traces were this long, yeah, then you can use FR4. When you say gigabits, you mean like also like gigahertz or? No, I mean gigabits as in usually double the frequency. So an eight gigabit design would okay. be operating at about four gigahertz. Okay. So if I had a four gigahertz signal operating at eight gigabits, I probably beyond that frequency wouldn't use an FR4 material unless signals were very short. If I can make a small board with very short signal layers, the message here is do simulation have a simulation tool that can estimate uh, skin effect loss and loss tangent loss so that you know at what point a, a trace, when does a trace get so long at what frequency that you need to change materials. Mm -hmm. Because if all your traces are this long, you can put 10 gigabit signals in FR4. But if they're this long, you can't. Mm -hmm. You see the point. So basically the material is not really important because of impedance, but it's no. more about losses in the materials. It's about losses and the impact on, on the signal. 
And what about the structure of the of the material? I mean, the fibers when it starts being important. When you have to like consider, for example, direction of the fibers or, oh, or size between the fiber uh, space between the fibers. Yeah, there's there's boy, that's a serious problem. You know, that's a whole <laughs> nother discussion. You know where I'm going. I mean, you're now you're talking about differential pairs routed above yes. loosely woven fibers. Yeah, you can get yourself in deep yogurt with that. Like usually if I guess if the uh, tracks are short, you are not going to see problems. Always but, problems are always for long traces. It's typically with traces that are in excess of about 75 to 100 millimeters. And typically. for signals about? Oh, frequencies typically above four gigabits, six gigabits. Okay. Okay, and then you really should consider what kind of material you consider are going it. to. At least okay. consider it. I mean, if you're doing 8, 10, 12, 20, 40 gigabit lines, even, and, and 40 gigabits, even if they're this long, you really need to think about it. Because at 40 gigabits, if you route two lines over, you know, that notched material, you're going to, you're going to, the propagation delay is going to be so drastically different that even at 40 gigabits with the extremely fast rise times, your crossing point's going to move way off center. And it could cause uh, jitter problems. And how do you simulate this? Is Good this luck. included in simulation? No. I don't know. Maybe there are tools that simulate it. I don't know of any. So you just have to like do it properly. <laughs> and well, yeah, it. basically you have to ask yourself, how much skew can I tolerate in my crossing point? In other words, how much can I move the speed of those signals one from the other before all of a sudden I've got a problem? If one of them's much faster than the other because it's routed over resin and the second one's routed over glass, which will be slower, then how much does that speed difference affect the crossing point and you have to do the calculation yourself there may be tools these days that simulate that if there are i'm not aware of it mm -hmm. okay okay let's go back to stack up yeah anyway this is a 12 layer stack up that we've used a lot uh it helps with power delivery every signal is referencing ground the critical powers are up near the surface uh, you've got two power planes to distribute them Secondary powers can be put in the middle of the board um, and so on, and it works really well, and that's really all this is saying. But the signals on layer four, for example, they are going to be closer to the power plane. So is not power plane going to have like higher impact on these signals than the Well, actually, plane? they're going to be closer, uh, slightly closer to the ground plane. So yes. the core should be uh, very thin? Well, the cores and prefregs will both, in a 12, by the time you get to 12 layers, the cores and prefregs will be about the same thickness. Okay. Which means the signal layer, the signals on four and the signals on uh, eight, no, I'm sorry, 12, Six. 11, 10, nine, the signals oh, okay. on nine and the signals on four. Yes, they're going to partially reference power, which means you really need to make sure that it's the correct power. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, the other side of those signals, there's a ground plane. Mm -hmm. So most of the energy from those signals will couple to the ground, mm -hmm. not the power. So the so most, most important signals, maybe you would like to route on the layers one, two, three, four, five, six, and middle, seven. The middle two layers yeah. or the top and bottom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We've also done a 14 layer version of this with ground planes in the middle between those two signal power layers. And that allows you to route really high speed signals in the middle of the board as well. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people say to me, Rick, I, I'd really rather route my signals near the surface and have power and ground in the middle because it makes it easier to route. But the problem with that, that diminishes power delivery because now you are delivering power through long vias 
the highest inductance that you will encounter in your board stack up is the inductance of vias. Vias have the highest inductance of anything in the board stack up. Even when they're really close together, they have high, they have high impedance, high inductance. And the result is that you'd like to keep power and ground near the surface because power delivery needs low inductance vias. Signals don't need low inductance vias. Power does. But when we are talking about vias for this stack up, I see yeah. two issues with this stack up. One mm -hmm. is microvias. Very often I have to use microvias because there is there are so many tracks that it's almost no possible to fan out the processor. And in this case, it would be like very limiting because we basically go from layer one to layer four. Yes, let, and, me, let me stop you. Okay. Let me stop you. This board is only for through vias. Okay. This is a stack up for through vias only. I have some friends in California who were the first company in the world to generate a hundred gigabit IO system. And the circuit boards in their 100 gigabit system were this 20 layer board. And you can see they have signals with power on one, basically just fan out. Layer one was fan out. Layer two was ground, three was power, four was ground. Notice what they've done. They have one, two, three dielectrics of power there. Do you know what that does for power bus impedance? It pulls it down so low that the inductance will be tiny even, in, even at gigahertz frequencies. And that allows you to deliver power to the IC through an incredibly low inductance path and get good power delivery into the IC. And it worked really, really well. So then they went from there, they went below the, that ground plane on four, they went to signal with power port, ground, signal with power, ground, mm -hmm signal with power. You can see how this just progressing. All of the signal layers had power pores and everything in between was a ground layer. Mm -hmm. And every power layer referenced ground only. And most of them, with the exception of power pores, most of the critical power was at the top and bottom of the board. When you say critical power, it means like... Uh... Power driving the core of the IC. The fastest. Power driving the really high speed IO line. Mm -hmm. The tens of gigabit IO lines. Their power needs to be distributed right at the IC level. So because the power the of, the, not, of the pins, which are switching very quickly. That's correct. The only way you're going to get power into those drivers to drive those tens of gigabit lines is to have their power right near the surface where the IC is sitting. If you have to go all the way to the middle of the board to get power for that, you're going to have such horrendous drops across the vias from the middle of the board to the IC that it's going to generate serious problems. So food for thought. And this is from, this is one last slide I'd like to talk about. This is a stack up from a company that generated the first four, 400 gigabit system. All of the signals on every circuit board were operating at 12 and a half gigabits. And these were serially summed to create a 400 gigabit system. But every signal on every board was operating beyond 10 gigabits. Their first two layers, they, they had signals on top or ICs on top with breakout and then poured power, ground on two, power on three, ground on four, with HDI vias making them really close together, and then through vias with signals starting on five and ground on six and so on, all the way down through the board stack. So it was essentially just like the board that we just looked at, except that this one was 34 layers. Mm -hmm. And they needed 34 layers to route all of the signals and get all the power and ground in the board stack up that was necessary to make this thing function at 400 gigabits. And I asked them why HDI and they said, well, that's funny because I had a chance to talk to them about it. This was the company in Denmark that was actually as a Swedish based company that attended a workshop I did in Denmark. And 
I asked them why, um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Shoot. Oh, I asked them why not through VIA. And they said, well, our original board was through VIA, but it was a 48 layer board. But by going to HDI on the first three dielectrics of the board and then on the bottom, we were able to reduce layer count all the way down to 34 layers mm -hmm. and still get everything done as we needed to without having to have as many layers. And I said, so the board, even though it was HDI, was cheaper. And they said, yes, it was. Interesting, huh? So basically, when you say HDI layer, it means there will be micro vias between these... Uh... Micro vias from one to two, two to three, and three to four. And then and there will stacked. be buried via or true hole via? They were stacked micro vias. And then the rest were basically buried vias. And... Uh... That's everything for today's video. Uh, again, I would like to thank you so much to Rick for uh, finding time and discuss this topic. And uh, I would like you to um, leave comments. Okay, I really enjoy reading your comments. So let me know what do you think about this video. Let me know what do you think about this topic. Did you learn something new? What was interesting? Uh, if you like this video, don't forget to press like button. If you would like to see my future videos, you know exactly what to do. Don't forget to subscribe. I would like to thank you very much for watching and uh, see you next time. Bye. By the way, my name is Robert Feranek.